Hello, everybody. I'm Miriam Lawrence on behalf of the Institute for Retired Professionals, and I'd like to welcome you all to this event, which is hosted by the Institute for Retired Professionals at the New School. And for those of you who don't know about the IRP, we are a group of approximately 300 retired and semi-retired people who, are, who provide our own curriculum, and we're both the students and the teachers for 30-some-odd courses each semester. And if that sounds of interest to any of you, um, well, we have um, a flyer at the back with the other Fridays at One programs. This is part of a series, Fridays at One, of the semester. And if you're interested, I would just suggest that you Google Institute for Retired Professionals and New School, and that'll take you up to our website. So with that said, I'd like to introduce today's program. Uh, this, this day is a long time in coming. And as many of you know, I have a particular interest in documentary film. And a few years ago, I saw a lovely film about two extraordinary women and their very even more extraordinary relationship, Edith Windsor and Thea Spire. The film, Edie and Thea, A Very Long Engagement, directed by Susan Muska and Greta Olafsdotter, uh, is the film that we will be seeing today first. And after the film, um, I must say that the way this program came about is that some time later, I read about the case challenging DOMA at, before the Supreme Court, and much to my delight, I saw that the petitioner in that case was none other than Edie Windsor, who I'd seen in this wonderful film. So right then and there, I was just determined that this was going to become a Fridays at One. And here it is, a Fridays at One. But it wasn't so easy to do, because I tried to reach Edie unsuccessfully a few times, and then I, we finally made contact when we literally, physically made contact. We literally bumped into each other coming out of my local deli. So, <laughs> so from that encounter, today's program was born. Um, after we watched the film, Edie and her attorney, Roberta Kaplan, who is here today as well, will talk to us about their odyssey through the court system resulting in United States versus Windsor, the 2013 case that struck down key provisions of DOMA. And for that, we are very grateful to both of you. At, Roberta has also written a book, Then Comes Marriage, which is on sale today. Forward by Edie Windsor. By Edie Windsor. And with both of them here, you have an opportunity to purchase that book and have both of them sign it. So I think that's a wonderful opportunity that I hope many of you will take advantage of. So with all of that said, and without further ado, we'll spend the first hour watching Edie and Thea, A Very Long Engagement. Please welcome Edith Windsor and her attorney, Roberta Kaplan. All right. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm just going to start by saying I, I, you know, I have a reputation, probably not undeserved, uh, of being a bit of a hard-nosed litigator. Uh, and as a result of doing what I do for a living, I, you tend to get thick skin. Uh, I remember in the movie, Thea, I had forgotten that Thea says that the only thing that makes her cry uh, is dancing. Um, I have seen this movie now, not as many times as you, but I've seen this movie now many, many, many times, and it still makes me cry. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> um, I thought what we would do is, Edie and I are going to ask each other questions, um, and then we'll obviously take questions for you, so we each have a couple questions we're going to interview each other with, and then uh, think of what you'd like to ask us. You want to start? Okay, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Who did you first meet? Can you hear? Who did you meet first? You got it? Okay. Who did you meet first, Thea or me? 
So uh, one of the very many incredible things that has happened in life, uh, and one of the most very many incredible things that has happened in connection with Edie and Thea and what happened after uh, Edie and Thea, which is United States v. Windsor, um, is that, uh, let me kind of bring you up to speed as to what happened after the movie. Thea passed away, as you saw, uh, at the end of 2009, um, or ex uh, early in 2009, excuse me. And at the end of 2009, um, I got a call, uh, and you can explain the context, I'm gonna ask her about it, but I got a call from a friend who was a friend of that guy, Brendan Fay, who you saw in the movie, who said, um, I have this friend, Brendan, and he knows this woman by the name of Edie Windsor, uh, and she's looking for an attorney uh, to represent her, she, as a result of her spouse's death, she had to pay a $363,000 estate tax bill uh, to the United States because of this law, uh, the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. And would you be interested in talking to her? When I got that call, I was sitting in my office on 51st Street, um, I knew exactly who Edie Windsor was. Uh, and that's not because I had ever met her before, it's not because I had ever laid eyes on her. It's not because I'd ever seen this movie. Uh, it's not because she was and is the celebrity that she is today. It's because uh, 18 years before that, I had been in my third year of law school. And I, I think it's fair to say probably more so, well, certainly more so than Thea, uh, and probably about to say maybe a little bit more than Edie, I was a bit of a, a late bloomer uh, when it came to acknowledging being a lesbian and my uh, homosexuality. I had certainly, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I'd certainly thought about it probably in high school. Uh, I knew, I know I thought about it in, law, in college. Uh, and I definitely thought it, about it in law school. But I waited until the bitter end of my third year in law school. I went to law school at Columbia to kind of have the courage to do or say anything about it. And it just so happens uh, that shortly thereafter, my parents, who were still in Cleveland, were coming to visit me in New York for the weekend. And they, my bad luck, as they were coming to visit my then studio apartment on the Upper West Side, they kind of had to wend their way through the parade. It was Gay Pride Week. <laughs> bad luck on my part. Bad luck and planning on my part. And, and by the time they got to my apartment, they were in quite a state. And they, uh, uh, my college roommate had been Ruth Messinger, whose mom, Miriam, I mean, Mary Messinger, whose mom, Ruth Messinger, was Manhattan Borough President. Uh, and she was leading the parade. And by the time my mom got to, to my apartment, she's like, what's Ruth Messinger doing leading this parade? What's everyone so proud about? What's with all the rainbow flags? You can imagine. Uh, and I said to my mom, this was 1991, I said to my mom, stop. And my mom continued, as mothers and daughters are wont to do. Uh, and finally, my mom said, you know, why are you being this way? What are you, why are you so insistent? Are you gay? And I uh, said yes. <laughs> And she walked over to the side of the apartment and started literally hitting her head against the wall. Um, people laugh about it now, but t t take it from me, it was not funny uh, back then. I, I have someone joke that it was like a Seinfeld episode, but it was a Seinfeld episode way before Seinfeld. Um, let me tell you this. this I'm not saying this uh, to criticize my mom. Uh, my mom could not be prouder of me and my wife and my son and Edie and what we've done, the whole thing. Uh, she tells me that my father like goes to get you know a haircut in Cleveland, and he manages to tell everyone in the barber shop uh, that his daughter did a Supreme Court case. So it's, it's my mom, like everyone else, has evolved, or like so many people, and and that's a good thing. But back in 1991, as you can imagine, I was a little bit depressed. I was a little more than a little bit. I was depressed, uh, and I was moving to Boston at the end of the summer. But I went around asking in New York City for a psychologist who was good on gay issues. That's the way you talked about it back then, good on gay issues. Uh, and I kept getting the same name. The name I kept getting back was Thea Spire. So I saw Thea Spire as a patient in 1991, two times, at least I think only two times, to the best of my recollection, in Edie's living room, because Thea was already quite disabled at that point, and she saw patients in the living room. And here's the most incredible thing about it of all, I think, which is um, during those sessions, Thea talked to me about Edie. Now, 
I'm not a psychologist, but I think it's pretty unusual for psychologists to talk about their own lives. But I've given this a lot of thought, and I, 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 I'm, I think I know the reason. I think Thea must have thought. I mean, I was a pretty stubborn person then, back then, so I am. I was pretty cynical about things. And I think Thea thought that the only way that she could persuade me that I could have the kind of life that I wanted was to tell me about her own life. So she talked about Edie Windsor, this great, brilliant mathematician uh, who had studied at NYU, who was this brilliant computer programmer. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, flash forward, it's 18 years now, it's 2009. I, when I got the call, I said to Edie, I'll just come over to your apartment, because Edie, I thought we could, should meet in person. And I knew where I was going, of course, but when I walked in, uh, it all came back to me. It was like coming back to the scene of an accident. It all came back to me, and I said to Edie, you've got to give me a minute, because I've been here before. Let me tell you why. Um, and then I had two other reactions. The first reaction was, oh my God, you are not like the way, uh, the picture I had in my mind, based on Thea's descriptions. Um, I kind of imagined Edie as this kind of math geeky, you know, thick glasses, maybe a slide rule in her pocket. <laughs> so when I took one look at her, I was like, that's not what I had in mind. And, and then the second thought, which was really overwhelming to me, uh, was, and you don't have to be religious to feel this way, it happens that I am, that God was giving me this opportunity to pay Thea back for helping me as much as she did and that I was going to do it. So that is the official beginning of United States v. Windsor. It's the official beginning of the sequel to that movie you just saw. Uh, and that's why I knew who Edie Windsor was in 2009. Um, let me ask you, Edie. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's talk in the movie, Thea uses the word disabled, uh, and she talks about the wheelchair quite a bit. You both talk about it quite a bit. Can you tell the people here how that changed during the movie and how Thea's mind changed? Because it so expresses okay. Thea to me yes. about this issue. Okay, we, both Thea and I felt that it was not necessary to, well, first of all, we never, uh, we never scheduled shoots with the, with the, the filmmakers. First, for the first, we're watching slides of ours and talking to the slides. And then they said, look, we'd like to do some things of you in New York, but it would be best if you, if you would be willing to call us and tell us when you're going somewhere where you wouldn't mind our showing up with cameras. So that's what we did. And, uh, and until very close to the end, we stayed that way. Uh, then um, something like three weeks before we finished shooting, uh, it was really that, that summer was the beginning, I think, uh, when Thea, uh, Thea said, Edie, we're making a mistake. Oh, I was, I was not mentioning any of the, the other things, any of the private things that go with, with her disability, which were, were, were increasingly serious. Uh, the, uh, and uh, I was like preserving her dignity. And she was happy with that. Until three weeks before the end, she said, Edie, it's a documentary, it's not just a love story, and people have to know that shit happens, and that you can still live and love, and uh, okay. So, so we called the filmmakers, and then every shot, the shots in the bedroom, the shots in the pool, everything like that was done, uh, was done after, after that decision. Uh, and it has made a huge difference. Uh, is it right for me to say it here? Uh, people who are disabled or people who's, who's Whose, whose spouses are disabled, uh, uh, okay, call, call or write to me, okay, to say thank you for that, thank you for that film. Uh, and it's a different thing from thank you for your case, okay, it's very different uh, and, and, and matters to people. And I feel it would be thrilled to know, okay, that it, how it matters to people that we did that. Uh -huh. Right. That's, Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. the right answer. You want a question? Sure, go ahead. Uh, all right. What about my story made you think it was the perfect case? Oh, well, that's an easy question to answer now because you guys just saw uh, why I thought it was the perfect case. Um, uh, you know, the truth is uh, that was not necessarily a widely held view uh, when we brought the case. Um, first of all, there was disagreement in the gay rights movement about whether it was the right time to challenge DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, and different groups had different views on that. I actually wasn't fully aware of that debate until later, but I now am, and I, and I, I know that there was some amount of dissension among gay rights groups. People were concerned, understandably so, that it was too early 
uh, to challenge this and that we would lose at the Supreme Court and that obviously would be a very bad thing. Um, I remember on that score thinking uh, that Edie had paid all this money to the government. It really was essentially a tax on being gay. Um, and that the only way she was going to be able to get that money back was to sue. There's no other way to get it back. And I thought she had a really good chance of getting it back. So I didn't feel that as a lawyer I could in good conscience could tell her not to sue, to just give up uh, and essentially agree to pay this tax that she uh, said that in words that ended up echoing what Justice Kennedy wrote in his opinion, that she felt indignant about having to pay the tax. Uh, Justice Kennedy's opinion is full of the word dignity over and over and over again. So there was that. Uh, then you, you kind of have to see, you know, it, it, it's not only the fact that it was this incredible tax on being gay, and, you know, again, call me crazy, I think our country started uh, because of a fight about unfair taxation. You know, I'm teaching that to my son now who's nine, so I think that's true. Um, but two, you have uh, this incredible love story and this incredible life together that you just saw. Um, who, you know, I want the, there's only one thing I know for sure in life, and that's that no one knows what life has in store for them, right? We know, none of us know that we could wake up tomorrow and, God forbid, you know, start having symptoms and go to the doctor and find out we have chronic progressive multiple sclerosis. No one knows that. But the one thing I think we all do know is if, God forbid, that happens to any of us, I want a, a wife at my side or a spouse at my side like Edie Windsor. Um, and I thought that not only would the, the country, the American country and the people understand that, but I thought most particularly the justices, if it ever got there, would understand that. They, they are essentially, many of them are Edie's contemporaries. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, who has called Edie the perfect plaintiff, uh, had a not dissimilar relationship with her husband, Marty, for many years, who's passed away. Uh, so those were all the, the many, many reasons uh, that I thought we would win. I thought we would win if we could persuade judges, Americans, and ultimately the Supreme Court, that the marriage that Edie and Thea had was no different than the marriage that any of them had, I thought we would win the case. And fortunately, we had this to help us do that. Um, Edie, so can you talk, as we touched on that a little bit, but I know at the beginning, why don't you tell the story about wanting to bring the case, what happened, and the role that the movie played in your uh -huh. mind as to why you wanted to bring a case. Okay, I had... Uh, first of all, we had been engaged. Uh, my engagement, thing, okay, <laughs> uh, and uh, the uh, for forty some years, right? And uh, and 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 that we were able to get married. What happened is we had thought it started with Massachusetts. I think was the first the first marriage, uh, of a same sex couple, and then uh, but then it was up to the states to make that decision. But the federal government had 1,100 rules and laws which had to do with benefits and responsibilities and the like uh, that, um, that applied to ma marriage. And that, and that law, that DOMA law, said the federal government will, does only, will only acknowledge uh, marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, so, so that was... That was the, the the ache of it. Okay, that okay, that that one of us paying this this extraordinary, and it wasn't just the federal government. It was also the uh, the state then had also had to to charge me a state tax because uh, the because all taxes are covered by that by I, IRS, which is a a, a federal agency, uh, and uh, the. Uh, so I don't, I don't even know where I'm going with what it. Was the, what, what happened when you tried to bring a case, and what oh. was the role of the documentary oh. played? First, I called, OK, I had been, once we, once we, I guess even before we got married, uh, there was this question of would New York State, which, which had, was, did not have, have marriage, would it acknowledge uh, other marriages? And it turned out that the Constitution of New York State says it, it, it acknowledges any legal marriage. So, so that was fine, and uh, and we wanted we waited for states that were close, and it was always something fell apart with it, and uh, and finally uh, we decided to go to Canada, and meanwhile I had been working for the Empire State Pride Agenda as a marriage marriage ambassador, and uh, so I knew a great many people in the movement at various positions, and I went into a meeting and uh, and I asked someone you know how do I find it. A secular officiant in Canada, 
and, uh, and he re referred me to this guy, Brendan Fay, who, who is the, the man who was in a brown suit at the wedding, uh, who then was critical in every way in, in, in causing this case even, in, in, in Robbie's finding me, my finding her. Uh, the, uh, at any rate, um, uh, Again, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, About the beginning of the filing of the case, how you found me, what happened first, and what was the role that the movie oh, played? Oh, I, oh, okay. First, I went to the gay organizations with the film, saying, I have a documented marriage. Use me. Okay. You know, <laughs> let's do this. And, uh, and, uh, and everybody said it's the wrong time for the movement. I then learned that other people said, no, she has too much money. That's not going to work. Okay, she had to pay that much for the thing, and uh, the uh, but so so I was done with it. I was done with it, and along came Brendan Fay again, who had introduced us to the judge who married us, and uh, and at this and oh, and who then in fact introduced us to the two women who ultimately decided to do the the documentary. There was no, we had nothing to do with that at, at all. It was all Brendan and, and the women. And then uh, the uh, uh, so I so so I gave it up, and Brendan didn't. And Brendan went to a guy named Ed DeBonis, who for twenty years had been in the business of legal placement. And Ed DeBonis called me up, and he said, "Brendan gave me your phone number. Is that all right?" And I said, "Brendan could do anything, you know." So so he said, uh, "I know some lawyers I would like to to address, I, who I think might be interested." Is that all right with you? And I said, yes, please, I'd be very grateful. And the next day, Robbie Kaplan walked into my, into my house. Now, I do have to give, tell you one other thing is that later, when the Supreme Court said they were going to, to, to take my case, uh, the, it was the first time that we were in the same room with Brendan and with Ed DeBonis and us, and, uh, and, and and because we were all celebrating the fact that, that I was going to the Supreme Court. I mean, and, uh, and, uh, and Ed DeBonis said, can I be honest now? I only called one lawyer. <laughs> uh, so that's how we got up. I mean, one of the, let me just comment. I'm going to ask you a question. One of the things that's amazing to me about that, or you, I, guess whose turn is, I guess your turn to ask me a question, but that... Even in the way the world has moved between 2009, when Thea passed away, and today, which is, you know, Edie really felt, and understandably so, that that, mar that that documentary provided her with a documented marriage, right? She could prove that she'd had this marriage to Thea by virtue of this, this wonderful film that was made. Think about it. Today, what couple, gay or straight, would think that they, you know, especially gay, would think they needed a documentary to show that they were married. I mean, the world, the, the pace at which the world has changed on this issue is unprecedented. Um, and I think, frankly, it's in large part because of the woman sitting yeah, right yeah. next to me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My turn? Yeah, your turn. You can ask anything you want, yeah. by the way. What was it like to, to, to argue my case in the Supreme Court? So, um, the case was argued, it took a few years. Actually, this case went at lightning speed in legal terms. We filed it in 2010. Uh, we were at the Supreme Court in March uh, 2013. And for those of you, yeah, I can see people acknowledging that is warp speed for lawyers. Um, I was very anxious about making sure the case moved as quickly as possible. Among other things, Edie suffered a heart attack uh, after Thea passed away, uh, and I was uh, bound and determined to make sure that she was fine when we won this case and that she was healthy and would enjoy it and we more than accomplished that, thank you. Um, <laughs> but so we got there very fast and the Supreme Court itself, um, as you can imagine, is incredibly formal place. When you walk in, there's an announcement uh, and there's a big red curtain, red velvet curtain and the curtain opens and the justices come out to the bench and it's, it's a whole thing. And, and the day of our argument, as you can imagine, it was kind of the who's who of Washington DC society. Uh, so everyone was going up to Edie, who was sitting, uh, wasn't sitting at the council table, she had to sit with the audience, but 
uh, Nancy Pelosi was paying court and Valerie Jarrett and a whole bunch of very high public officials. Um, I remember thinking to myself, I'm not going to pay attention to that because if I do, it's just going to freak me out. <laughs> so just like kind of sitting at my, at my desk and making, not looking at anything else. The one thing I did look at, though, is we had had a joke on the case that I was going to make sure that my hair that day was at least as high as Nancy Pelosi's. <laughs> Um, and I have to tell you, I succeeded in that. It stayed high the whole day, and it was even higher than Gloria Alred's. It was the, the two yeah. stiffest competition for me. Um, I have to add something. Could well, I yeah, of course. Get, uh, okay, the people asked me what was the most important thing that day, that it was oral arguments in the Supreme Court. For me, what was the most important thing? I saw it's really two things. One, she was incredibly cool and calm and collected, uh, and I thought, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be all right. And... Uh, and Nancy Pelosi was at the far right end, and I was at the far left end of the visitors thing. And uh, Nancy Pelosi got up and came over and introduced herself to me. I said that was the second most important <laughs> thing. <in the> day. <laughs> um, so when I started to argue, I, I was the second, the um, last person essentially to argue in over two days of argument because the Perry case, the Prop 8 case, was on the day before. I was the first openly gay person to argue in two days. Um, and when I started, I mean, if you listen to my voice on the tape, and I can hear it now, you know, I, I know what was going through my head is, what in the hell do I think I'm doing? You know, I'm just like a nice Jewish girl from Cleveland, Ohio, and who the hell do I think I am to be arguing this case in the Supreme Court? Uh, but shortly thereafter, you know, I've been doing cases for many years at this point, and shortly thereafter, you kind of get into the zone. Um, and ironically, I think what happened here is that uh, particularly when the justices got a little irritated with me, I actually think it had the opposite effect probably they intended. It actually motivated me. Because uh, I remember thinking, you know what? You know, I'm from New York City. Uh, and I've been up a lot against a lot of tough judges in my time. You're nothing compared to Jed Rakoff when he's mad. So, you know what? I, you know, I can handle this. And I kind of remember thinking that actually during the argument. Um, I tried very hard in the case. Uh, I had a post-it on my computer that said it's all about Edie Stupid. Um, and I tried very hard in my case to kind of keep my own personal stuff. I was a married lesbian with a kid who was obviously impacted by DOMA. But I, my, I think my job as an attorney is to keep that out of the case. And I tried very hard to do so. Um, but there was a moment in the Supreme Court argument where the chief was really pushing me. And he said, you know, isn't it true, Ms. Kaplan, that politicians are falling over themselves to support your side of the case. Uh, and when you hear my answer on the tape, uh, you, they don't videotape in the Supreme Court. You get put in jail if you do that, but there is an audio tape. Uh, when you hear my voice on the tape, it cracks in giving the answer. And I honestly think that that was the Robbie Kaplan coming out. I just couldn't keep it down anymore. Uh, and I ultimately said to him, um, we were arguing about what has caused the change. He was suggesting it was people like Clinton and Obama who had changed positions. And I said, no, 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 you, you got it wrong. Uh, what's changed is what I said is the flip or the opposite of the moral disapproval that the House expressed when they passed DOMA in 1996. It's not moral disapproval today. It's a moral understanding that gay people are no different. Um, and that was actually the last question I had. It was perfect timing. Uh, and, and then we went outside, and, and Edie was treated like you know, the lesbian Jewish Mick Jagger as we, as we walked out. <laughs> Um, and acted like the lesbian Jewish Mick Jagger, I should say. Um, I'm going to ask a question for you, Edie. So there were, there were issues in the case, even before you met Thea, that ended up becoming very important. And, and there was an issue in the case about whether uh, uh, gay people have a choice about being gay, whether you can choose to be gay or whether you should be able to choose not to be gay so as not to be discriminated against. Uh, can you talk about your, because okay. I right. haven't seen this picture, talk about your marriage with, uh, Saul, uh, with Mr. Windsor yes. and how that impacted yeah. that. Okay, um, the, um, okay. I, uh, I had had a big crush on my, my, brother, my big brother's best friend for years. And uh, I, mean, I, was, I was 10 years old and 12 years old. And, uh, and during World War II, uh, Everybody, they all, everybody who had been buddies would go, if they were, came home on leave, they would visit everybody's family. So, so, so this guy would show up at my house, and I got to where suddenly I was like 14 and, uh, and, and wearing special clothes because he was coming, and my family disappeared for a while so that I could, okay, have an opportunity to talk with him. 
And, uh, and ultimately, we started college at exactly the same time. They came out of the Army while I was first starting college, and we went to school together. And, uh, and, and ultimately, uh, I really didn't know that I was gay. Uh, I dated boys mostly, most, most of my, my life. I, I had crushes on girls, but it didn't, it didn't occur to me that it was a way you could live or anything like that. Uh, I fell in love then with a, with a, with a woman at school, and first time uh, seriously in love. And uh, uh, I broke my engagement to this all, and, uh, and then ultimately, though, it would come New Year's, and he would call up and say, what are we doing New Year's? And we would, we would begin to date again. And, uh, and ultimately, we, f we finished school, and within, a, within six months of when we finished school, we got married. And, uh, and I thought we could do it. And I really thought we could do it. Uh, the, uh, if I saw two, two women, though, out, I had never been out on a Saturday night, that it, unless it was with a boy or a man. And uh, the, uh, so, uh, so what really happened is that, that when I did see people, two women together on a Saturday night out, I, 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 I was so jealous. And I, her, and I finally said to him, uh, honey, you deserve more, and I need something else. And we parted enormously good friends. However, I always, I, except for my 70th birthday, we, did, we, did not, we were not in touch at all. My 70th birthday, he called and said, I still love you. Okay. Uh, but he had, a, he had a beautiful wife and beautiful kids and, uh, and exactly the life he should have had. Uh, and, uh, and, and would not have had with me. Okay. I would always have been wanting elsewhere. And uh, anyhow, uh, the, and then I was very upset because people were using his name. A uh, friend of mine, uh, in, uh, okay, uh, Ariel was writing for the New Yorker had his, his last name in there, his full name. And I, and I asked her to take it out, and she was able to take it out. Uh, and uh, the, uh, because I thought, I don't know if his wife knows he was married before. I don't know if his kids know he was married before. I knew a lot about them because when he died, there was, his kids had put a lot of stuff up on the internet. And everybody from Philadelphia called me to, to tell me where to find it and stuff. Uh, the, uh, and anyhow, months later, I was, going to, uh, I was going to a party, and I was dressed and ready to leave to walk out the door. I had my coat on to walk out the door, and the phone rang, and, uh, and somebody was kind of hesitant. And I said, please just tell me who this is, because I am on my way out the door. And, and she said, I'm Saul's widow. And, uh, and I said, wait, I'm taking off my coat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, I, and we talked for about 40 minutes, and... Uh, and she said, he always talked about you. She, she didn't know the case. She said she, she read the, about the case, just as part of being alive, kind of. And, uh, but she, uh, when she saw my maiden name is when she realized who it was. And uh, I called my uh, And uh, anyhow, we've become friends, and that's great. And, uh, and, and yes, they did know. He said he talked about you all the time. He talked. He, she knew the names of my siblings, and uh, you know it, it was amazing, uh, actually, how how much he had talked, and and we had so much in common that it was, there's no question we'll be good friends forever. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, that's all. <laughs> this is what uh, this is the re I'm going to give you the legal relevance now. I'm just going to read you a chapter from the the book. Then comes marriage. Yeah. Um, during a conference call between our team and the lawyers for the House Republicans on May 5th, one of their lawyers asked us for document, documentation regarding Edie's first marriage. Really, I thought? This is how you plan to defend DOMA? Apparently, they believed that the fact that Edie had once briefly been married to a man showed that being gay was a choice. I knew, however, that the details of Edie's first marriage were actually a very powerful argument for our side. In fact, I was so thrilled that the House Republicans wanted to get into this issue that I actually did my own version of the Saturday Night Live Church Ladies Superior dance with my colleagues as soon as the call ended. Uh, why, of course? Because if Edie had had a choice about being gay, she'd still be married to that guy, right? Yeah. She didn't have a choice. Yeah. So we were pretty thrilled. Yeah. Okay, okay, I think one more question for you and one for me. 
What is the impact if winds are legally, and where do we go from here? Okay, so this is the fun part. Uh, the Supreme Court in, uh, let, me, let me begin with where the situation was when we filed our case and where we are today. When we filed Windsor in, in 2010, only five states allowed gay people to marry. Uh, as Edie mentioned, that did not include New York. Uh, that's partially my fault. Uh, I lost the New York marriage case at the New York Court of Appeals in 2006. So Edie and Thea had to go to Toronto to get married in part because of me, but I think I kind of paid him back for that one. Um, I also went to Toronto to get married a few years before that. Um, five states when the case was filed. When I argued the case at the Supreme Court in March uh, 2013, nine states allowed gay people to marry. When the case came down, the decision came down in June, June 26, 2013, 12 states. Uh, and here's the truly enormous thing. In, over the next two years, between the decision in Windsor on June 26, 2013, and the decision in Obergefell on June 26, 2015, uh, 37 states had decided to allow gay people to marry. Um, why is that? Um, I believe, and I think a lot of judges agreed with me, that the reason is, is because of what Justice Kennedy said uh, in the opinion itself. Remember how I referred to Edie using the word indignant. Uh, in his opinion, he uses the word dignity 11 times in 23 pages in Windsor. And what he seems to be saying over and over and over again is that gay people have the same dignity as everyone else. Uh, and if you accept that proposition, that gay people have the same dignity as everyone else, then it's pretty hard to accept the fact uh, that you can just treat them as second-class citizens under the law. Uh, and that's what courts in states over the next two years, places like I never would have dreamed, uh, Utah, Oklahoma, Virginia, all agreed, leading to the decision uh, in Obergefell, which said gay people have equal dignity in all 50 states. Uh, so what I think that means going forward is that at least as far as the government is concerned today, the government can't discriminate against gay people because they're gay. No government, federal, state, or local can do that. The big question, of course, is whether uh, private companies can do that, or other people. Uh, on that score, let me say that I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think that Kim Davis is the greatest gift to the gay community in years. Um, I, I, I'm going to send her a big thank you card. I'm serious. I mean, I think you have to say who she is, though. Right? Oh, I think Every, everyone knows. So Kim yeah, Davis yeah, is, yeah, the, is yeah. the clerk in uh, Kentucky who, tried, who took the position that her religious beliefs did not allow her to comply with the decisions of the United States Supreme Court. Um, why do I think she's such a gift? First of all, her legal arguments are ridiculous. Uh, public servants can't decide which parts of the Constitution they agree with and don't. And every court, even Justice Kennedy, in a speech at Harvard Law School a couple days ago, said he should, she should resign. If that's her position, she should resign, number one. Number two, look at the people at her rallies. You know, they're wearing white robes. They have, con they have swastikas on their shirts. They're carrying Confederate flags. I mean, nothing could be a better manifestation of how hateful Many people are on the other side. And then I just have to say, they're kind of the icing on the cake, which is she went ahead and lied about a private meeting with the Pope. Uh, I'm not Catholic, but I have to assume that it's probably not a good thing to lie about meeting with the Pope. Uh, and there was just a poll that came out today where the numbers have changed so that now today, 58% of Americans believe that no government official should be able to refuse to marry a gay couple uh, because of their religious beliefs. So that's where we are. Right. Um, That's it. Right? One more question for you I get to ask. Uh, Can I ask one more question? Yes. So I just have to ask this because it's so fantastic. There was a picture uh, in the movie, as you pointed out to me when we were watching it, of a doll Thea had by the name of Willie. Oh. Can you tell me the oh. significance <laughs> of Willie? Okay. Willie, Willie was indeed her doll, the doll who was on her shoulder. Uh, and Willie came to America with her uh, and... Uh, and actually, she wasn't allowed to bring her dog, but she was able to bring Willie, which helped, okay, because she missed that dog a lot. Uh, the, uh, at any rate, at some point at IBM, uh, I've just had a wonderful uh, other experience with IBM now, okay, over all of this stuff. But, uh, but at, at some point, uh, the, uh, uh, okay, I, I was hiding who I was. I never said, we were, what? We were, a we were a special group. We had a four at the time life building. We were systems people who never at IBM have worked in New York City, in big cities at all. Okay, we're off somewhere. 
okay, where people can't copy what we're doing, that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, but but we, we had this, this strange special group uh, be, because it was, New York sports programming was a one-shot thing, right? And anyhow, the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't even know where I'm going with it. So you're going, ending up, what was Willie? Who was Willie? Oh, okay, and so I lied, about, I lied about my life, okay? We were very good friends. We were all very close. We had drinks together every day after work. We had lunch together. Weekends, they, they did wine tasting. I did not because I was gay. And ultimately, somebody said, hey, Edie, how come you never came to the wine tasting? And I was able to say, because I was gay. I said, because I was queer, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 I still don't know where I'm going. Uh, Willie. Okay, oh, okay, I lied at some point. They, okay, somebody was calling me up all the time. Uh, and, and Thea called a couple times. And, so, and, and I said, oh, oh, I'm dating her brother. I'm dating her brother, Willie. Okay. And, uh, okay. and now the question is, where is Willie today? Willie is still in my closet. Okay. <laughs> I can testify to that. I've seen him. <laughs> He's true. not looking so good. It's true. <laughs> um, so how about if we take some questions from you all? Um, we can do that for about 15 minutes. There are books here. The love my wonderful editor from Norton, our wonderful editor from Norton, Amy Cherry, is here. And Amy and I, and Edie and I can sign them, but please ask questions. And don't be shy, because I took Scalia's questions, so I can take yours. Yeah. Yeah. And please so wait to get the microphone. Oh. Did, the imply, did the Supreme Court imply in its decision whether there would have been a difference between being gay in choosing to be gay? No, yeah, well, not directly. So uh, Justice Kennedy is kind of known for writing opinions that are very kind of high brow and kind of really much uh, exist in the realm of principle. And so none of the really specific arguments like that on any of, in any of these cases he has really addressed deliberately. But he has said over and over again that he believes uh, being gay in the, the, the desire of gay people to form a lifelong commitment uh, with another person and live their lives like that is a fundamental part of human dignity. And it's a dignity that needs to be respected under the Constitution. So he has certainly hinted at what his views are. Uh, he has never dealt directly with the scientific evidence, which I think is actually a good thing because it's scientific evidence is pretty overwhelming. No, there is gay reparative therapy does not work. It leads to suicide. Yeah. It does not work. Um, first of all, I'm indebted to you folks because I'm one of those people who got the 1,100 benefits that you argued for. Thank you. Um, I hope you got a tax <laughs> refund. Pardon? I hope you got some tax money back. <laughs> uh, I, I actually took a picture of the tax return statement <laughs> because of the way it, you know, it had both of us on it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the, the timing issue that the, pretty much the whole gay community, or at least a lot of it, felt that you were in bad timing. And in fact, as it turns out, it was the absolute perfect timing because the decisions that came after, I mean, the fact, I think the Supreme Court knew when they made your decision that the next decision would come because the courts would find with the, but you folks kind of had a vision about the timing issue that was so counter to what all of the politicos in the movement felt. Can you talk about a little bit how you dealt with that and how you felt about that? Yeah, so a couple of things. When, when the Prop 8 case was filed, uh, as you probably will recall, uh, it was filed by Ted Olson, who's a very famous, prominent Republican lawyer, and David Boyce, famous lawyer, though not a Republican. Uh, and when that case was filed, uh, the gay groups actually issued a press release the next day criticizing it. Um, and I was very worried, actually. I had forgotten about this until I started writing the book, but I, when we went back to look at, to look at the emails, most of our early meetings with Edie were basically saying, you know, if this happens in our case, can you handle it? Are you ready? You know, would that be too hard for you? Will you be able to deal with the fact if this happens? It turns out it didn't happen. Um, in part, it didn't happen, I think, because Mary Bonato, who's a great hero in our movement and who brought marriage in Vermont and Massachusetts, had already filed her own case in Boston, the Gill case. Um, when that case was filed, it was very clear to many people that Justice Kagan would have to recuse herself because she was... Solicitor General at the time, um, so it probably wasn't going to get to the Supreme Court, but she had brought a case. 
uh, number one. Uh, number two, in part to thank them for bringing me into the New York marriage case, uh, I decided to bring the ACLU into my case. Um, I don't think I realized at the time, but I think the added benefit of that is it provided critical criticism insurance in the sense that it made it hard for the gay groups to criticize us. Um, but once we started, I think, and once people started to see the reaction to Edie, and I really insisted, I, I was harsh about this, I really insisted that any press in the case would only be about Edie. There was gonna be no press in Windsor about the lawyers or the organizations or the activists or anyone else. If you wanted to talk about the Windsor case, you talked about Edie. Um, I think they quickly saw what a huge impact that was having uh, and how, how incredibly important Edie's story was and how people could relate to it. And so a lot of that resistance dissipated very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, and even during, during the process, since other people were, were, were getting married, okay, uh, and uh, I think the fact we ourselves were seeing people that we never saw before and, uh, and, and, and loving who we saw, and, okay, but, but I believe that, that a great many, well, how America changed its, its position. Okay, and we went from, from a majority opposed to the idea to a, a majority in favor of it and more and more people. I think as people saw, okay, discovered that their kid was gay or their next door neighbor, they saw the marriages, they went to, to weddings, uh, they, okay, and I think, I think the whole attitude changed in the process. We were very fortunate we had both in the, in the appeals court and in the Supreme Court our, our cases were, were defined by, 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 by two justices, both of whom were our, our uh, self-defined, uh, uh, what's the word I want, uh, not, not the opposite of liberal. Oh, conservative. Uh, conservatives, okay, okay. I couldn't uh, imagine what adjective you were, were going to use. Both of which are self-defined conservatives, were the guys who made the brilliant decisions for us. Anything else? I'm feeling guilty with these people standing, waiting, so. Uh, other questions? Okay, well, people can feel free to ask us up there. I'm gonna, I want to get you down from here. Yeah, I want to get you down to a Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.